Welcome back to a special midsummer edition of the Pacific Century, a Hoover Institution podcast on China, America, Asia, and the fate of the 21st century. I'm your host, Misha Oslin, speaking to you from steamy Washington, D.C., where most people are on vacation, as are our friends in the universities. But that doesn't mean that the world has taken a break, let alone Asia. And in fact, if anything, this has been a busier summer than usual. And I am very happy today to be joined by one of the busiest people in Asia who has been recording and interpreting what's been going on. And that is Catherine Hill the Financial Times Greater China Correspondent, who is currently based in Taipei. Uh, We are going to talk about everything you've been reading uh, in the Financial Times and other media about Nancy Pelosi's trip to Taiwan, about the Chinese reaction, about what's going on between China and the United States and Europe and Greater China. So, Catherine, thanks for joining me and welcome to the Pacific Century. Thanks very much for having me, Misha. So um, actually, before we get into all the, uh, the the great headline stuff that you've been reporting on, I actually want to want to start with you. Um, uh, how long have you been out in Asia? I know that that uh, many of our listeners read you every day or whenever you're filing, which is multiple times a week, but they probably don't know um, who it is that they're reading. So uh, have you been in uh, in China and Taipei long? Um, this is actually my second posting here for the FT. So um, the first time I uh, reported for the Financial Times from Taipei was uh, from 2003 to 2008. Then I moved to Beijing. From there, I moved to Moscow just in time for the first Ukraine crisis when they annexed Crimea. I spent five years there as the Moscow bureau chief, and I have been back in Taipei since 2018. So really, crisis follows you, is what we're saying. You... Well, I, I wouldn't <laughs> hope so. I, I, I really hope that it stops here. <laughs> you may be the cause, exactly. Every every other country is saying, don't send Catherine here. Something bad's going to happen. But that's great. You've actually been, so you've been following um, uh, a lot of, in fact, you know, you've been in, in the key places that have dominated uh, Washington debate uh, over geopolitics and the, the change in the international system for the past decade, uh, which is uh, Russia and and China. And now you've, you've been, you know, at really what people call uh, the, the epicenter. I think The Economist this week has the cover of Target Taiwan, which, you know, for those of us who've been doing Asia for so long, these are exactly the type of... Um, uh, how would you put it? You don't want to. It's not warmongering and it's not hysterics, but it is a a level of intensified concern that that people often downplayed. That that we said, look, things really aren't going to get that bad. Uh, those who claim that things are oh like the end of the Asian century, uh, you know, are overstating things. But uh, here we are, where um, the common wisdom is that the U.S. and China are on a collision course uh, over Taiwan. So why don't we start? Um, with what you've been reporting on uh, lately, which is, of course, the reaction to Nancy Pelosi's trip, as well as uh, the trip that Senator Ed Markey took this week. You had a piece this morning uh, in the paper talking about another set of military responses. Um, A simple question, is it really different now, or are we all just hyperventilating over nothing? It is really different now, Uh, but um, from my perspective here on the ground, it may be uh, different now for for slightly uh, reasons that are slightly slightly different uh, from those that may be reflected in in, in some of the reports or some of the commentary we see uh, every day. So uh, what I uh, observe is that um, I still believe that that talk of war and a full-blown um, Chinese invention of Taiwan uh, may be um, an exaggeration, at least from where we are now. Uh, if you look at how the Chinese military uh, treats the use of, of, or the potential use of military force, um, they have a whole set of options and uh, they're preferred option is uh, 
not to be in a war, not to fight in a war, um, but to use their uh, the military power they have to deter others, to intimidate others, to maybe uh, coerce others, uh, others into um, well accepting the political goals they have or that the Chinese leadership might have, might have. And I think what we're seeing now is basically an escalated version of that. We've we've seen China apply. Uh, lots of different kinds of political pressure and economic pressure and and some military intimidation tactics um, uh, against Taiwan before, but this clearly uh, is a new quality. And mm, it really reminds me, I mean, the, the kinds of operations they've conducted around Taiwan over the past what what has it been? Uh, Ten days, two weeks, uh, resemble some of the things they've been doing around the region elsewhere as well. Not uh, at this level of tension, and and uh, it's not triggered that that uh, kind of uh, fear of imminent uh, hot conflict. But uh, we've seen this before around the the uh, contested Senkaku Islands, which uh, China calls the uh, Diaoyu Islands, or around the South China Sea. Uh, China using um, the threat of military force and some limited uh, um, uh, military tactics to try and uh, change the status quo, to uh, increase their role in a conflict situation and, and to um, underpin political claims they might have. Are, are you surprised or were you surprised by the, the level of... Um fury and uh, violence. Um, so in, you, you mentioned the Senkakus uh, and also down uh, in the South China Sea. And of course, there um, where you're right, the pressure has been unrelenting in many. And of course, there's the island building campaign, which which changed uh, uh, the geopolitics of of, uh, of the South China Sea. The, uh, the pressure against Japan has been unrelenting. And yet, you know, China wasn't launching missiles, uh, didn't have live fire exercises, do the types of things that we saw. So first, um, were you surprised at at the intensity uh, of the response? Well, I wasn't surprised when it happened because we, we have been hearing uh, enough warnings, especially from the U.S. military uh, ahead of time. Um, so uh, we were all bracing for some pretty bad stuff. Um, and then uh, afterwards, or since the live by exercises uh, ended, uh, there has also been a lot of analysis saying uh, it's good that there's still some things they haven't done. If you look at the PLA's um, uh, internal writings or the, the, the textbooks they have um, about what a deterrence campaign, and, and this is what this is, or what a deterrence campaign looks like, uh, it, it has uh, other instruments in, in their arsenal as well. They, they could have theoretically, according to their own um, strategy or plans or options, they could have launched some or what they see as warning strikes against territory. So they, there could have been actually some... Um, uh, some some strikes on maybe uh, outlying islands or even uh, Taiwan proper as well. These would have been maybe the small islands like Matsu and Kinmen and. Well, those are the populated ones. Then you also have options like Pratas, which is one of the the islands in the South China Sea, uh, where you only have coast guard and military. That that would have been a, a bit less. Um, uh, escalatory, but uh, then like another option that was being uh, discussed uh, ahead of time in the run-up to, to this situation was whether uh, PLA uh, fighter aircraft might attempt uh, to fly over Taiwan proper um, or right up into um, uh, sovereign airspace. Uh, they didn't do that either. So um, some people, uh, you mentioned that you, you see this and it's been interpreted by some as a uh, a deterrence campaign. And exactly what are they trying to deter? Well, they've been talking uh, about what they don't like a lot. Uh, on one side, of course, there's Taiwan and on the other side, there's the, the US. And this triangular relationship between uh, uh, Taiwan, China and the US, uh, that tension in this relationship uh, has been rising for a long, long time because um, things have been changing on all three sides, right? So uh, what they're trying, what they say they're trying to deter is um, Taiwan independence. 
And uh, they're also trying to deter uh, behavior from the US side, which they describe as hollowing out the one China principle. Um, so uh, they don't want, uh, they, they uh, intensely dislike uh, the current Taiwanese president, Tsai Ing-wen, uh, who uh, has refused uh, to um, state that Taiwan is part of China. Uh, she, more in more detail, she's refused to to um, restate that Taiwan would accept the so-called ninety-two consensus, which is a really convoluted thing, which we maybe don't have to go into. But it was a formula used by the previous uh, government that allowed the the two sides to have some ambiguity and and uh, somehow um, make China feel better and and uh, convince them that that. There was still room for um, for a future um, where uh, Taiwan would be unified with with China. So um, they they uh, want to discourage or further dissuade the current uh, Taiwanese government from from um, asserting its de facto independence and and maybe moving for further in that direction. And and they want to stop what they uh, have watch the US do, which is expand engagement and, and uh, contacts and dialogue and, and cooperation with Taiwan. And do you think they are going to be successful? That is one of the big questions going forward. And I, I think um, the most difficult thing or the, one of the very difficult things for the Taiwanese government in this situation before uh, Nancy Pelosi's visit was to figure out whether they actually wanted her to come because that that they were in a di dilemma, um, especially after the visit uh, or plans for the visit became public and were were uh, discussed at length. So, um, one potential scenario would have been that the U.S. would have backed down and not uh, let her come. Uh, that would have created a precedent um, under which China successfully coerced uh, the U.S. or a third country, um, in in any case, into uh, um, acquiescing to to isolating Taiwan. But uh, the alternative was risking uh, what we have now: uh, uh, heightened military tension. So. Um, uh, Taiwan was in a very, uh, very difficult position uh, ahead of time. But um, they, they I, I think on balance, the, the Taiwanese government thought that it was um, vital uh, for Taiwan security in the longer term that uh, they um, uh, that they continue to have uh, friends and partners abroad uh, stand with them and engage with them to uh, not have this kind of status quo of, of an independent or uh, de facto independent uh, Taiwan hollow out. So others have also uh, interpreted what's happened over the past two weeks uh, as essentially Taiwan, uh, as essentially China blockading Taiwan, that, you know, they have um, made the airspace dangerous for, for civilian flights to go into, certainly when they were firing off uh, missiles, some of which land in Japan's EEZ, uh, that they were flooding the waters around Taiwan. So not only were they showing that they could do it, some interpreted it as that they were sort of actually doing it. Do you, do you, what, do, what do you make of that interpretation? Yeah, I would disagree with that because um, if, if you look at what uh, – a, a real full military blockade actually means is is you have to uh, uh, disrupt, if not fully stop, uh, external links and traffic, sea and air, and none of that happened. I mean, the only flights that were cancelled, I think there there were a few Korean airlines uh, cancelled some flights for a couple of days uh, during the live fire exercises. Uh, other flights were diverted around the closure zones. Um, but they they all continued, uh, and uh, I think mm, sea cargo traffic was not disrupted at all. Of course, uh, the the fear was that if uh, this situation continued, and if uh, there or maybe if if China had announced like uh, another and another and another of those live fire exercises with closure zones, um, it would certainly have. Um, uh, cause deep worries about the possibility of a full blockade, uh, and it would have 
um, had an economic effect because then, uh, for, especially in, in sea traffic, you you would have seen uh, costs go up, fuel costs go up if you if you have to kind of uh, go around those zones, and and insurance costs go up because there the, the risks increase. But um, a full blockade requires actually more than just uh, just announcing six zones around the island with big. Um, sea and air spaces between them, and um, we're not there yet. Uh, I, it's, um, I think it's a fair point to say this was a rehearsal, and uh, the PLA has been very good, not just uh, uh, in this recent period, but over for years now, um, extracting multiple benefits from its military operations around Taiwan because they've they've been flying around Taiwan's air defense ident identification zone on a very regular basis for a long time now and um this uh meets several targets at once for them because they they can practice they've been uh, flying uh, multiple uh, kinds of aircraft uh, uh through those um areas they've uh, practiced different kinds of operations at the same time obviously it's a great kind of a gray zone warfare because you intimidate your adversary. You also impose a cost on them because Taiwan has to scramble those uh, fighters all the time to, to make sure that um, they have enough warning time and they they uh, uh, basically call them to to turn around and, and leave. And um, and they signal to everyone else as well that we're around here and we could we could even do more than that. So it, it's no different in this situation that uh, they uh, had a great round of of um, exercises in in the actual theater where a blockade or an invasion or whatever else would take place, which they haven't done before, like in uh, joint operations with all kinds of different aircraft and and uh, ships together at the same time, and maybe also some some electronic warfare, certainly cyber operations, all the rest of it. So um, uh, they they did practice, but they also, of course, achieved the um, or at least some effect in psychological warfare and uh, deterrence. So from that perspective, then, are you, for either your own assessment or what you may be hearing from uh, your sources in Taiwan, as well as um, uh, allied militaries in the region, did did we learn anything from what the Chinese did? Meaning, you know, did they pull back the curtain more than they have in the past on showing their capabilities, how they're going to interoperate? Um, as you mentioned, uh, joint force, um, a whole range of, of, uh, of, of response that, that maybe we haven't seen, or was this just run of the mill? It was just more than usual, or do we have a better sense of what they might do? Well, I mean, um, there, there has been a lot of, of some reporting about how this is a great spying opportunity for the U S and, and, uh, some of their allies. Um, I, I don't have any insight on on what they might have gleaned. Uh, I I've talked to a lot of people who uh, do this, um, like military analysis for a living, or or are in uh, the military themselves, and and um, my initial idea was also th that oh, this has to tell us a lot about whether the recent uh, PLA reforms were successful, how far they've come in in pulling off joint operations, what uh, what can we uh, see from how they would would organize their uh, um, command and control, and uh, whether maybe their dual structure, um, because this is a party army, right? So their dual structure of, of military commanders and, and um, uh, political uh, officers somehow hinders operations. I think um, it's a bit of a disappointment in that regard, uh, because we, we've, um, they exercise a lot in this season anyways. And uh, we, we have the opportunity or we, 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 mm, have the chance normally to um, read in uh, the Chinese military media and the official media quite detailed reports on on their regular exercises, um, and the the kind or the way they write about those exercises. Although there's a lot of party speak in there, and it's very tiring to re read that, but still uh, there are recurring phrases, and you can tell when um, the military thinks that they're 
still is a problem, or maybe they've made some major breakthroughs. So uh, you can probably learn more from those regular exercises than you could uh, from this one. Also, there, there was one argument that um, it may be very impressive that they could ramp up this um, uh, several days long joint operation uh, over such a large territory that quickly. But I would caution that um, maybe they didn't ramp it up that quickly after all, because they, they've actually known that this uh, visit, Pelosi's visit, would take place. They've known it for quite a while. At least um, they knew. Uh, first, the first time I think those um, plans for the visit became public was in April. So uh, if you will, they they got strategic warning several uh, several months ahead. So they would have maybe made plans for that. And we, we've heard from both the US government, also the Taiwanese government, that they uh, believe that this was not a um, furious uh, response or, or reaction um, off the cuff. Uh, to this visit, but rather uh, that China may have taken the visit as a pretext to pull something off they, they might have planned anyway, but didn't re really have the opportunity for. So uh, I've I've had people uh, um, explain to me here in Taiwan that they think uh, the, the Chinese would, would probably really like to um, test some of those missiles in exactly the way they did. Um, traversing the skies over Taiwan, uh, but in normal times that would have been clearly uh, deemed unacceptable elsewhere. And uh, that I mean, there's a reason that this has been compared to North Korea because only North Korea would do such a thing previously. But now uh, China's joined the club. So, um, but uh, the reaction uh, to that um, part of the exercise was actually a lot milder than the international reaction to the North Korean missile test in 2017 that did the same thing over Japan. Uh, so in, in that sense, the, the Chinese calculus, if it, if it was that, um, might actually have worked out. So this morning you reported on a, a new set of exercises, again, not the live fire exercises um, in, in China. Uh, I think actually uh, announced an intermediate or or a set in between after Pelosi and the new one. I mean, so the, the the point is that it seems to be becoming more regularized, and some are calling this the new normal. That there will be constant activities, constant exercising. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, China exercises a lot this time of year, but are we in a, a new normal? And what does that what does that even mean? Yeah, we certainly are. I'm. Uh, I, I think so. So um, the first phase of what we saw after Pelosi's visit was um, four days, well, four calendar days of um, what had been announced as exercises, and and um, those four calendar days was the duration of the closure of those um, pieces of airspace and and waters, and you do that. Um, it, to warn ships and planes uh, out of those areas because you're going to uh, conduct live fire exercises. But as far as we know, uh, live fire exercises of artillery and missiles were only actually conducted on, on day one or day two, I don't recall exactly. So um, the expectation uh, was psychologically in Taiwan and elsewhere that after day four, this would be over. And then maybe the big question was, um, will they announce another set after that or, or what will happen? But then um, after the closure zones uh, expired, the PLA said, surprise, surprise, we're still exercising. So they then they they just they didn't fire missiles, but they they continued to uh, uh, fly uh, fighter aircraft and and sail ships and so on. So and and they had all these announcements uh, two or three times a day with video and and um, uh, photos out of the Eastern Theater Command. Uh, uh, allegedly showing what their forces were doing that day and also describing like what the uh, what the task was that day so saying uh, uh, today we're we're um practicing the assault on taiwan proper or the um and today we're doing anti submarine warfare whatever um so what happened on and then last week uh, on wednesday i think uh, the pla finally said okay th so the uh, the exercises have been completed, uh, but we will keep close eye and uh, continue to conduct patrols. And and of course that was had been accompanied by a barrage of of um, 
commentary and propaganda on state media with uh, military analysts in, in China saying, uh, so we one of the big things we've achieved is uh, really getting rid of that uh, Taiwan st uh, Taiwan Strait median line for good, which is uh, that that used to be an unofficial buffer between the two uh, sides set um, uh, by the U.S. in the 1950s, and and it had by and large had been respected until a couple of years ago uh, by two by both sides. But China had been um, uh, softening it up with incursions since again uh, since 2020 so um they they were signaling already that uh we went there during the exercise and and we will just stay we'll stay closer to you from now on how significant by the way is that you, you you've written that they've they, they've said we've effaced this line the line has mm -hmm. been erased and no longer exists and this is a line that goes down the taiwan strait essentially down the down the middle and it separated as you said uh the two sides it was considered a um a, a border so to speak and a, and a buffer between the two how significant is it in your view that it is if it is indeed now uh erased by china well i mean uh initially or originally the line was meant to um give both sides uh some kind of protection and early warning because uh, the the strait um is not that broad and if you especially in, uh nowadays uh if you fly a fighter jet over there you, you'll be in taiwan in a matter of minutes um so uh if if there is uh something um between the two, kind of a buffer, and and you have this tacit agreement that you you won't go there. That obviously uh, lowers the risk a little bit. So, in uh, in that sense, it's uh, it used to be very meaningful. But I think the uh, the bigger uh, significance right now is that um, the uh, PLA can just step by step, little by little, uh, expand uh, the area uh, where it conducts uh, regular operations and uh, through that um, underpin its claim that uh, this is ours to begin with. This is, um, and and uh, anyone who says otherwise is just wrong. And and the status quo is not what you say it is. The, the status quo, we, we're showing you what the status quo is. The status quo is that we are operating around here uh, and we're getting really close. So I think that's the, the main significance. So if you look at what happened since the PLA or after the PLA said uh, last week that the exercises had been completed, they didn't stop. They, um, they continued... Uh, flying across the median line with an average of, I think, 24 or 25 uh, warplanes a day since uh, between last Wednesday and last Sunday. And then on Monday, uh, after the second U.S. Uh, congressional delegation arrived, they said, OK, uh, uh, this is too much. You need to be punished. Uh, we're, we're starting another round of exercises. But um, there is actually no sign that what they called an exercise on Monday was any different from what they had been doing between Wednesday and and, and Sunday, the four days before. So uh, what we what we have now is a constant presence. And the only interesting thing is whether um, the number of uh, assets involved, like aircraft and ships, will uh, gradually um, drop over time as we get into autumn and the weather uh, gets a bit rougher in the Taiwan Strait and then during winter. So. Summing up, then everything that that you've been talking about, and it's been, I mean, incredibly clear exposition of of what's going on and and what's changed. Um, how do how do we assess it? Uh, was Pelosi's trip reckless? Did Pelosi's trip cause this? Were the Chinese not going to do this before she came, or was this the perfect opportunity to take significant? strategic and and security steps that they wanted to but didn't have an excuse for how would you you know looking back a little bit as an historian if you can although we're, you know we're in the midst of it well how would you assess what the, the how important the trip itself was and was it really a colossal blunder that may have now put us into a new era i would not uh, say that the trip caused this because i still think that we need to keep in mind uh, who is making the military threat here? Um, so uh, 
I, I still think uh, probably you put it quite aptly. You, uh, you said this was a perfect opportunity to, um, I, I don't know what, what exactly you said, but it, it to, for China really to, to take strategic gains. Um, and uh, clearly, um, they've said many times what their goal is. They want unification. They want Taiwan under their control. Also, the terms on which they um, or the terms which they are offering uh, are um, worsening from Taiwan's perspective over time, as uh, their language gets um, tougher and more, uh, and the mix of Kind of carrots and sticks, if you will, is um, shifting more and more to the sick side. Uh, so um, that's all clear, and that's they they they've said that m many times. So mm, I, I think the Pelosi's visit offered an opportunity for them to uh, to do this. But then again, um, would you rather have had the alternative? I don't know. I mean, mm, mm, I was among those who who believed before. Uh, the the final decision had been announced that she she was actually coming i was among those who, who said yes yes i think at this point she has to come otherwise uh, china gets to decide um whether other countries can uh, engage uh, with taiwan and that would only enable them more to to step up uh, coercion uh, but of course that that said um mm, the motives of Pelosi's personal motives for for planning and making this visit, uh, I'm not privy to those, but uh, may be questionable because um, it is, of course, um, you have to question who takes responsibility for for what, and just uh, um, coming here and taking the stage and and saying in Taipei. Uh, China does not get to decide uh, the travel schedule of of uh, members of Congress. Well, that's um, uh, she's right, of course, but but uh, the ones paying the price are others, right? So, um, as I said, I'm not privy to her considerations. I, I was also not privy to the uh, discussions uh, Taiwanese officials or diplomats uh, may or may not have had. Uh, with her team, and and if there maybe were some um, notes of caution uh, uh, expressed from the Taiwanese side at some point, but um, I, I think it, at the end of the day, the aggressor is not the US and is not Taiwan; is it's uh, it's China. Well, let's talk about the Taiwanese side for just a second. Um, you said they pay the price, which obviously they do. Um, if anything, what are you hearing from? Uh, people in the government about now their assessment are they in a do they feel they're in a worse situation do they feel they're in a good spot because you had pelosi come you've had markey come uh you certainly didn't have uh, i mean you know president biden uh publicly in essence tried to uh, deter uh pelosi from going but after the trip the the government of course supported it um, so what are you hearing from the Taiwanese themselves? Do they are, are they more worried or are they more confident? I don't think they're more confident. I mean, if you look at uh, uh, President Tsai Ing-wen, I think her central concept or one, one of the, the key goals or, um, or lenses through which she views this whole Taiwan's whole security situation is um, uh, keeping what Taiwan has preserving really what um and and safeguarding what they have their the democracy their way of life their security their uh sheer survival uh so uh and uh, let's not forget that uh, Tangwen has been at this for quite a while she uh, already she, she was among um those scholars who who gave some input um uh, to the uh, government of Li Denghui in the 1990s and um on uh um, how to strengthen the basis for for the sovereignty of the Republic of China on 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 Taiwan because uh, this followed the um, uh, this episode where Bill Clinton um, uh, expressed the or, or pledged the three no's to uh, not not supporting Taiwan independence not um, uh, supporting uh, Taiwan participation in the UN and I I forget that the third escapes me now but basically um, assurances uh, to China that weakened uh, Taiwan's um, uh, 
uh, chances to participate in the international community. And, and the Taiwanese at the time felt that they had to push back against this uh, just to uh, not to make progress towards independence, but just to basically preserve uh, what the level of of uh, uh, independence and and participation internationally they had, and I think uh, uh, Tsai has been at that ever since, and and this is the mainstay of what they're trying to do. And in in that context, you can maybe um, understand that how important. Uh, international visitors are for them. And let's also not forget that uh, uh, members of Congress visiting Taiwan uh, has been absolutely common for many years. It's not it's not something new. Um, so the only uh, point here, I think, for them was really pushing back against this being eroded and, and uh, uh, preserving this kind of contact with the outside world. Yeah, the um, the Clinton three nodes, um, you mentioned the first is um, we don't support independence for Taiwan, that's Clinton's words, or supporting one Taiwan, one China. All oh, right. As yeah. as you know, as a formulation. And then, of course, as you said, uh, shouldn't be a member of any organization for which statehood is a requirement. So as you said, that really cuts it out from uh, cuts it out from much of international uh, the international community. Um so let's jump across the strait then and and just talk a bit about china um how how do you see it and 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 what are you hearing if anything about how china uh you know when we say china of course we're talking about xi jinping we're talking about um the the, the central leadership sees this are, are they are they more confident or are they are they frustrated because they couldn't deter either pelosi or markey from coming um, as well as the rhetoric of the U.S. government once the trip uh, had uh, and the trips had gone on, or are they? Do they think this is perfect? Because as we were mentioning a few minutes ago, this is something that they've wanted to do in terms of expanding their strategic space, and therefore they are now um, in a better position uh, on, let's say, the hard power side of things, if not necessarily a better position on the soft power side of things. Right. Yeah, this is obviously the the, the difficult question because uh, uh, none of us are, can get into Xi Jinping's head, and and uh, even outside his head, uh, um, visibility is very limited as to what, <laughs> what the what the Communist Party uh, leadership um, wants or 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 plans. But um, I mean, maybe it's better. Uh, for all of us, if China is confident, because that wouldn't uh, mean that they have to resort to even more extreme uh, means to to um, uh, reach their goals. But um, of course, for for China, uh, I've I've talked a lot about how how China is the aggressor. But um, uh, to be fair, uh, on balance, of course, for China, the situation is also really really difficult because um, uh, they have not been the only ones. Changing the status quo, uh, things have uh, to start with Taiwan. Things have changed enormously in Taiwan uh, over the past few decades. Ever since Taiwan became a democracy in the early 1990s, uh, it um, has become very, very clear that uh, a large majority of the population does not want uh, to become part of China, and um, that picture has even has become even more pronounced. And and in in that. Um, in the course of, of uh, those years since then, China has tried many different things to convince the Taiwanese or to kind of make unification palatable to them. Uh, they they offered this one country, two systems model, which uh, it, it has often been said that Hong Kong killed that for the Taiwanese, but actually it was a non-starter from the beginning. Um, so uh, it's it's just the Hong Kong situation has, has made it just even more uh, clear to the Taiwanese that they can't possibly want this. Um, so uh, Taiwanese public opinion became much clearer and also much more pronounced. And so, so China tried um, economic integration. They they um, they opened economically, and and uh, Taiwanese uh, people and money have played a huge role in making. Uh, China, the factory of the world, and and uh, an export superpower, and all the rest of it. Uh, so th the economies became closely integrated, but uh, public opinion in Taiwan moved in in the other direction anyway, uh, and so that didn't work. And and um, China tried many other things as well, a mixture of uh, trying to address individual 
uh, groups of the population in Taiwan and then maybe trying to engage the opposition party and trying to foster like anti-government groups in Taiwan, trying uh, social disruption and none of it has been really successful. So, it, it, of course, everyone in Taiwan dreads the day when the when the uh, Chinese Communist Party finally comes to the conclusion, OK, peaceful doesn't work. Uh, let's try war. But um, even that is, of course, not not really an accurate description because there is a very broad range of uh, things that the Chinese Communist Party can do between peace and war. And I think that's where we are now. Uh, and that's what they've demonstrated over the past a couple of weeks. So uh, I think they're, they're probably, they, they must be uh, um, satisfied with uh, what they've achieved because they have changed. Um, they've established a new normal, which uh, puts them at an advantage and they will have time to try that out now for a while. And um, I think the name of the game is intimidation. They, they Okay, they didn't manage to create panic uh, during a few days of military ex exercises, but um, they can try other things. They can try if they can wear people in Taiwan down and, and uh, undermine morale if they keep this up for months on end and maybe uh, raise the heat a little over time. That that is possible or and if that doesn't work they could maybe add some some more uh, economic coercion too they can also uh, it remains to be seen whether their deterrence element works in in terms of uh, third countries so um the us didn't uh, uh back down and and uh, they actually conducted this second congressional delegation that was obviously planned uh, uh earlier um, they they didn't shy away from that. But uh, what about other countries? W what about uh, more Japanese parliamentarians visiting in the months ahead? What about Europeans? I, they, there's a number of, of European uh, lawmakers visits planned, and we don't know if those will go ahead. So um, we'll probably only know in, in a few months time. And what about the argument that um, the visit, Pelosi's visit was particularly um, uh, provocative because the 20, 20th Party Congress is coming up this fall. Uh, it's Xi Jinping's supposed moment to secure a third term uh, as party head and, of course, leading the country. Um, and so uh, this was seen as a direct affront, in a way, to him uh, and his control over, you know, China's uh, greater destiny. Is that did that? Do you think that played into any of it at all or? Um, given how things have played out, uh, does this, if he needed to be, does this strengthen him going into the party Congress? Does it weaken him or is it a wash? I don't think it weakens him now. Um, I'm I'm still um, a little bit unsure about um, the overall uh, public verdict in China because public opinion in China that's a that's a very strange beast you never know like how much of what you see um in, in polls or in uh, uh, social media on and and uh, among so-called opinion leaders it's very hard to tell what is real and what what is just manufactured but um there was certainly uh, a um a wave of uh expressions of of uh, discontent disappointment even anger uh when it turned out that uh the the chinese military was not going to shoot down pelosi's plane because that was one of the uh, scenarios that had been discussed by by some nationalist commentators ahead of time so um i'm not sure whether this is a success um or of, of Xi Jinping uh, in the public's eyes, but then the public doesn't really matter. I mean, this is, it's it's the party, um, not even the party cutters, they, it's really the party leaders uh, who, who matter. And I would uh, think that uh, he's played his hand well and and uh, he he can consider himself strengthened for now. So I know it's late there and you've, and you've told me you've already had almost a 20 hour day or something crazy like that because of the, the, the time differences and taking up all the slack. So let me ask you a final question on the assumption that we don't have war, that Taiwan doesn't get invaded, doesn't get obliterated. And that one great way to support Taiwan is to 
increase the number of Americans and others visiting Taiwan. You've, you've been there. This is your second time there. What are the three things that a visitor to Taiwan absolutely must do or see? And in the spirit of my old friend, John Yu, who always used to ask this question, tell us your favorite restaurant in Taipei or anywhere in Taiwan as well. So what do people need to see and do in Taiwan and where do they need to eat? Wow. Okay. So um, eating, um, I mean, night markets are not really that um, uh, that um, fashionable anymore, but I still like them. And and I, I particularly like uh, one food stall uh, on the night market in Jilong in the northern port city uh, that um, sells oh god how do you uh, how do you translate that into english it's a kind of a um noodles made out of a sort of beans so it's glass glass noodle with mm -hmm. lots of uh, bits of seafood and soup in it and um and lots of coriander on top i i just love that sounds um, great so yeah so that's outside the the um the main temple in Jilong, and that's really worth uh, going for. Um, what to do and what to see. Now, that's a difficult one. Depends on on how much time you've got on your hands. But um, I think if you can, you should uh, try to not only stay in Taipei, but uh, maybe um, uh, go for a, a mountain hike. Mm -hmm. uh, well, you need a lot of time for the really uh, high mountains because you need permits for for uh, many of them. But uh, there, there's some places uh, closer by in summertime, for example, you can you can hike on the grasslands on the northeast coast and you get magnificent views. And um, what else uh, in um and in, in Taipei, what I particularly like is the old town in the west of the city, which oh. uh, used to be, um, used to, uh, which all, had almost collapsed when I was a student and, and first uh, came to Taiwan in 1991, but has now actually been revived and many of the houses have been uh, renovated very nicely with, with restaurants and, and uh, workshops in them. So that's... Uh, that's a wonderful uh, afternoon stroll down those uh, old lanes and having some nice coffee and maybe uh, buying some nice fabric or um, a teapot or whatever. So, yeah, that's probably a good mix. And I would also, of course, add the National Palace Museum for anyone. Yes. Yeah. Yes, of course. Well, uh, and so many other visiting. things. Yeah. So, well, that's great. Well, I... I uh, I think um, you, you'll have uh, spurred some uh, some uh, adventurous travelers, hopefully, to get over there and see uh, what is a beautiful uh, country and, and uh, you know, in a fascinating society. But uh, even though it's getting close to midnight your time, uh, just, again, uh, your explanation of of everything that's been going on and, and uh, what it what it really means is absolutely clear. Uh, and uh, we appreciate uh, you taking time to join us. And, and obviously, again, uh, Catherine Hill, who is the Greater China Correspondent for the Financial Times. Uh, if you're not reading her, you probably are, but if you're not, you should be. Uh, and uh, we really appreciate uh, your explaining to us behind the scenes what's, what's happening. Thanks so much, Misha, for having me. It was a real pleasure. Well, for the Pacific Century, I'm Misha Oslin, and uh, assuming that we don't have any outbreak of war in Asia, we'll be back in a few weeks, and we look forward to you joining us then. Bye-bye. This podcast is a production of the Hoover Institution, where we advance ideas that define a free society and improve the human condition. For more information about our work or to listen to more of our podcasts or watch our videos, please visit hoover.org.